I love the wormhole life in EVE Online. I think that's worth saying loud, just in case people hadn't already picked up on that from the rest of this channel. But to me, there is nothing more enjoyable than huffing gas in a gas cloud, or ratting C3 anomalies and killing sleepers, whilst furiously spamming D-scan just to make sure that you don't have a fleet of cloaked cruisers stalking your every move. It's high risk, high reward, high tension, and extreme amounts of fun for me. But you can't always get everything you need in a wormhole. Sometimes you need to bring stuff in and out, and for that you need a hauler. And it's not just any hauler will do when you're including the high risk environment of a wormhole. No, you need something like a blockade runner or a deep space transport. Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzi, and in this video I'm going to teach you how to haul through wormholes. I never thought I would find myself enjoying the industrial side of EVE Online. It's something I've looked at from a distance many times in the past and kind of gone, yeah, probably not for me. I said in my gas huffing video that the concept of shooting rocks and building ships just never appealed, until the Air Career program got me to undock and try gas huffing and suddenly I was hooked on that. From there I decided that, well, I've got some industrial skills already, this character isn't really geared around combat, maybe I could skill into some of the hauling ships to help corp mates move their stuff around. Then I got myself both a deep space transport and a blockade runner, and yeah, it's another playstyle that I'm hooked to. It's the high risk, high reward style of things, I think. I've already done a video on why I think that the permanent loss system in EVE Online is what makes this game truly fantastic, and this kind of proves it to me. I don't think that I would enjoy hauling if I were doing it just through high sec. That doesn't appeal to me. But jumping through wormholes on null sec with a ship full of super expensive goodies? Yeah. That's a really exciting time for me. And so in this video, I'm gonna talk about deep space transports and blockade runners, and I'm gonna showcase a fit for the Mastodon and for the Prowler, the two ships that I run. Talk about the differences between them, how to use them, and how you can enjoy these ships as well, running, hauling runs between A and B. It's one of the best things about living in wormholes, if I'm completely honest, that I wake up every morning with a new connection to somewhere in New Eden. And it means that you need to suddenly adapt to that. Today, I could be four jumps from Jeta. Tomorrow, I could be seven jumps from Heck. A couple of days later, I could be two jumps from Dodixie. And so you need to be able to move stuff around and be able to sort of adapt and roll with that situation. I love it, but hauling becomes a necessity for that. And so I'm going to show you how I'm doing it now. Let's begin this journey into the wonderful realm of high-risk hauling by opening up the ship tree. Now, before we jump in, it's worth just making a note on why I chose the ships I chose. There are going to be people who tell you that the Galente Federation haulers, or the Amar Empire haulers, or the Kaldari State haulers are absolutely the best ones, and those are the ones that you should be flying. Thing is, I took a good look at all four deep space transports and all four of the blockade runners, and I ultimately settled on the Minmatar ones. There's two reasons for that. One, because I'm a Minmatar fanboy. Both my clones are Minmatar characters, and I just enjoy the way that those ships look. And I think to myself that, you know what, if I'm going to fly a ship, I'm going to fly the one that I enjoy looking at, I enjoy just flying. To me, that enjoyment is more important than the 0.5% slightly better version that you could be flying if you'd bothered to go elsewhere. And so that's really the bottom line there. I think that looking at all four of the different empires, there wasn't that much between them. They all have subtle advantages and disadvantages in certain situations. So for me, flying the Mimitar ones was just the one that looked more fun. The second part of this was that I had done the career agent missions for the Mimitar Republic in all three of their areas to try and build up reputation, so I was already sitting on a whole bunch of wreaths. So when it came to like relocating from Heck, where I was originally based, to where Catskull chose to base afterwards, I already had a load of wreaths, so it made sense to train up Mimitar Hauler to move stuff around. But we're not going to be talking about the wreath in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Tech 2 transport ships, the Blockade Runners, and the Deep Space Transports. Now these are locked behind Omega, you will need to have Omega active in order to use these ships, but there we go. So, on the left hand side on this, and this is the same for all four of the Empires, you have the Blockade Runners, we'll talk more about these ones later. These are some of my favourite ships in the game generally, and that's probably because they have Covert Ops cloaking capabilities, but they also have here on the right hand side the deep space transports. 
Now, deep space transports are kind of your just typical generic hauler, but with that kind of dialed all the way up to 13. So let's have a look here at the Mastodon. Yeah, we even get a cool name for the Mimitar, the Mastodon. One Earth is an Ossator or an Oxator or an Ocacator, however the heck you pronounce that weird Galente name. Yeah, anyway, so <laughs> we get bonuses for Mimitar hauler, which you should have already trained before starting to fly these. Pretty high, 7.5% to shield booster amount and 5% bonus to ship maximum velocity. In fact, we can get some pretty fast speeds out of the Mastodon. Strap a micro warp drive to this thing and it actually goes as far as a hauler can, you know, go. But ultimately, it's all about like the shield booster amount. We've got good tank and that on this thing. It's a typical hauler. The transport ship skill then gives us a 5% bonus to fleet hangar capacity, 25% of full training, which is really nice, and a 4% bonus to all shield resistances. So again, you can see that the shield is just being pumped up on this thing. If you want to survive with this, it's essentially about making the ship as beefy as possible and just tanking all the damage whilst either support arrives or whilst you move to safety. More on that later, and we'll talk about the fleet hangar in just a moment as well. Finally, we then have a roll bonus two point bonus to ship warp core strength which means they need at least three proper like points on you to hold you in position so we're talking about warp disruption or scramblers here like either two scrams or a scram at a point or three points in order to actually hold you in position we then get a 100% bonus to the benefits of overheating afterburners micro warp drives local repair modules and resistance modules so if you find yourself in a situation where oh no people are like actually you know hitting you and dealing some damage, you can just overheat your micro warp drive and suddenly, woof, off you go into the distance. You burn yourself out of that bubble nice and quickly or away from the threat whilst you warp to safety. Finally then, a 90% reduction to effective distance traveled for jump fatigue. We're not gonna go into that one. It's a really useful skill, but we're not gonna go into it in this video. The fleet hangar though, this is cool. So when we look at the Mastodon, if we go into its attributes here, we see it's got a eh, tiny hold, 4,500 cubic meters, and there's nothing in here that expands that, right? So like, what's the point? It's a tiny hold. No, it's all about that fleet hanger. The fleet hanger starts off, I'm trying to find it here on the list, I think it's 50,000 cubic meters that it starts with. There we are, fleet hanger capacity, 50,000 cubic meters. That is a big hold. You can put all kinds of stuff in here and 50,000 cubic meters. I did a hauling run earlier for a guy in our corporation and just chucked like two battleships, well, a battleship in there with all the fittings and a load of extra stuff that he wanted and carried it through to our wormhole station. No problems. Simple as that. Nice and easy. 50,000 cubic meters. The cool thing about a fleet hold as well is it's not just open for you. If you are floating out in space, you can have fleet members come up to you and they can open you like a cargo container, which means they can do all kinds of really cool stuff. You can use it for looting, you can use it for just carrying things around for people. Oh no, it's like, you know, we've been running a load of combat stuff and it looks like we're running out of ammo. I can bring out a Mastodon and those guys can warp to me, restock on ammo, and then go straight back into whatever it was they were doing. You can sit there with people in a mining belt and they can come along and just drop the gas off into the fleet hangar or, the, or into the fleet hangar and you can carry it backwards while they go and mine. Then you turn around, come back out with a nice clear hold and they haven't stopped mining. Nice little supply chain going on there. Now I mentioned that fitting the Mastodon is kind of like just essentially it's the generic hauler, right? It's all about that tank, making it as thick as possible. But when it comes down to it, that's kind of a bit of a simplification. There's a couple of other things we do need to consider when using something like this. Notably, it's mobility and what we do if we're caught in a gate camp, specifically like an interdictosphere gate camp, because we're gonna be going through nullsec or wormholes where those are a very real possibility. So for the tank, I'm currently running two compact multi-spectrum shield hardeners. Now I probably will upgrade one of these to a multi-spectrum shield hardener too, I just don't have the skill trained up quite yet. It's literally what's training right now, so by the time I finished making this video, by the time you're watching it, I'm probably running the two already. For a bit of extra tank, a Kaldari Navy medium shield extender, just to boost those numbers all the way up. In fact, if we were to simulate here, you can see that this gives us a whopping 48 and a half 
1,000 effective hit points. Nice. Good amount of damage for your opponent to try and get through. And again, if you perhaps have slightly better skills than I do, you might want to rejig some of this fit around for other things. Now, you may be noticing that we've got a really awful align time here, 14 seconds. Of course, that's because we're currently looking at having everything active. With what we currently have otherwise, 11.29, which is under 13 seconds. And why is it important that it's under 13 seconds? Because we're running a compact interdiction nullifier. Now, I've done a video on interdiction nullifiers already, but basically a compact or an enduring interdiction nullifier activates for 13 seconds. We've got a 12 second align time, a 13 second activation here. We should be able to align and warp during the uh, activation cycle of that interdiction nullifier. Now, whilst we're in the high slots as well, it's worth just taking a look that we have an improved cloaking device. Very useful if you need to just stop in a situation, warp away out of a gate camp to a planet or something because you're worried there may be another gate camp on the other side and you want your interdiction nullifier to cool down. You arrive wherever you are, you point in a direction, burn your micro warp drive with a instant uh, and, and overheated cycle and then activate that cloaking device. You'll only get one cycle out of the micro warp drive drive, but you've got a decent speed that you're now burning off into the distance. I mean, heck, if we were to overheat that, you can see there, 16,000 meters per second we can move at, and then you drop the cloak. Uh, put the cloak on and just drift off to safety, whilst whoever it is chasing after you, you know, just now goes, oh damn, he's cloaked. You can now align, get yourself prepared, and jump for the next gate with your interdiction nullifier ready to go. In the low slots, in order to get this align time, I have had to go for two inertial stabilizer twos and a nanofiber internal structure two. The fourth low slot is an aura warp core stabilizer. Activate this to get a little bit of more stability just in case someone does get a few points on you. You can just kind of shrug it off and warp away. Again, using the interdiction nullifier as well if it's a bubble. For the rigs, this does require, he says with his mouse misbehaving, a medium core defense field extender two for the shields here and we need a medium ancillary current router too in order to get that little bit of extra power grid to cram everything in. Finally here, we have a medium micro jump drive. This is something I will talk about in future videos, but incredibly useful for getting out of a situation that otherwise you might be completely losing your ship in. And I just love this. It's tanky, it's ridiculously fast with that micro warp drive. I mean, standard over, you know, work on the micro warp drive 944, but overheating it to 1,600? What? For a hauler? That's insanely fast. And I think that's honestly one of the things I love about this ship most, that you can just really tank a lot of stuff. You can run surprisingly safely, and it's just great fun watching someone try to tackle you, and you still make it away. Run to a, a planet or the sun or whatever, burn off safely into the distance with a cloak on, they will never find you. Next up then, let's talk about blockade runners. These are some of my favorite hauling ships in EVE Online. Like genuinely, these are so much fun to pilot. They are incredibly fast, they are nimble, they are slippery to try and pin down. It's like piloting an eel with the world's largest backpack. Like trying to grab one of these and hold it, Mm -mm, not gonna happen if you know what you're doing. This does come with the downside that they don't carry nearly as much as a deep space transport, but sometimes you don't need a 50,000 cubic meter plus 25% cargo hold, sometimes you just need 13,000, at which point if it's 13,000 or lower, my prowler can handle it. Let's take a look at its traits then. So the Mimitar Hauler bonus is going to give us a 5% bonus to the ship's cargo capacity, 25% additional bonus at full training, and a 5% or 25% bonus to ship maximum velocity. Again, these are fast little ships. The transport ship's bonus gives us a 5% bonus to warp speed and warp acceleration. So this is the speed that you are inside warp, so the amount of astronomical units per second that you max warp at, plus your warp acceleration the speed that you achieve that. So jumping from one side of a system to the other is a lot faster than initially it would appear because you are going to be reaching your maximum warp speed faster and you're going to have a higher maximum warp speed. 
We then have a 20% per level reduction in cloaking device CPU requirement. At full transport ship 5, that is a full 100% reduction in cloaking device CPU. And as we see from the roll bonus, it can fit covert ops cloaking devices. Huzzah! My favorite things in the game. Probably why I like these ships so much. And covert cyanosaurial field generators. We're not going to talk about this in this particular video. This is the kind of thing you use for creating some really cool PvP scenarios. It can be used for, like, you know, hauling and stuff like that as well, but for the most part, yeah, that's more of a PvP thing, mainly. Again, don't at me in the comment section. Cloak reactivation delay reduced to 5 seconds, just like a lot of the other covert ships. If you do get decloaked for whatever reason, it's only 5 seconds before you get to pull it back, and it's immune to all cargo scanners. What's that? If people try to scan you to see what cargo you, they, uh, you have, they're gonna get no reading. Now this is a double-edged sword. This is very much a double-edged sword. It means that someone who's being a little bit more, mm, I'm not so sure about this, if they've got a bit more of an expensive ship and they're thinking to themselves, do I want to blow you up and risk you being completely empty? On the other hand, this kind of ref makes this what people refer to as a shiny ship. Because it's immune to cargo scanners, because they're so fast, people are just going to assume that you are carrying a full hold of the most expensive things on the market. You, you will get attacked and jumped at every opportunity flying a blockade runner for the simple fact that you just could be carrying a load of stuff and they won't know until they destroy you. So do bear that in mind. These are high risk ships and that's what I love about them. Finally, a 99% reduction to effective distance traveled for jump fatigue. Again, we'll talk about jumps and sinos and all that in other videos later. Not important for this particular one. Going into the attributes, we can see that compared to the deep space transport, we have a significantly larger hold here. Now, a little bit misleading. I think it actually starts at 3,500. You can see that this is because I've it's on green. It's because we're looking at how this has been fit for me here. But we get a lot smaller cargo than we had previously with the deep space transport. In fact, if I am to open up the fitting screen here and take a look at the fit, you'll see that we're currently sitting here on about 6,300. It's really not that much, but we can change that around as needs require. What this fit is giving us is a ridiculously fast align time, 3.11, so under four second align time. If you're using the micro warp drive trick, this makes you nigh on uncatchable. You can just warp so ridiculously quickly and you can can do that using a covert ops cloak so we don't have to worry about what you know people locking onto us you can do the whole micro warp drive cloak align to the point then drop the cloak in the micro warp drive and just instant warp off to wherever you are in the distance micro warp drive cloak trick incredibly useful skill that i will teach you in one future video but if you know that running a blockade runner you are probably never going to get caught as long as you are good enough at piloting it Again, we have an interdiction nullifier here. This time, rather than the compact, I've gone just for a standard interdiction nullifier one. We've got a full 10 seconds of activation time on that interdiction nullifier, and this one, the interdiction nullifier one, has the shortest cooldown, so I can use it, again, much faster. Again, if you do jump out of a bubble, don't go straight to the next gate, because what happens if there's a bubble there, you fool? No, always, if you are jumping out of an interdiction sphere, jump to something like a planet, or a station or anything that you don't think is, is likely to be bubbled. Go there, drop your cloak whilst you're in warp, so, sorry, activate your cloak whilst you're in warp so that you arrive at the other side completely cloaked. You are going to be much, much harder to chase and catch at that point. On the subject of being hard to chase and catch, micro warp drive 10 mega, uh, sorry, afterburner here, 10 mega newton YS8 compact afterburner. It's all we need. You can go for micro warp drive here. I really don't see it as necessary. The ability to afterburn is more than enough. You just land on grid, get a bit of boost out of that. I mean, you can see we get pretty good speeds out of this with the afterburner active, 801.3 meters per second speed. That's as fast as the, uh, as the Mastodon was almost as fast as the Mastodon was with its micro warp drive simply active. And of course, if you really want to, you can overheat that to get some really nice over a thousand meters per second speeds off that. That's kind of all we need really. Um, so it does the job, gets us away from our landing point and allows us to move off quite quickly. Little bit of tank here, kinetic shield amplifier too, just to help boost up the kinetic damage, uh, kinetic holes here. We then have as well a Republic Fleet large shield extender. Yes, 
a large um, in order just to pump up those shields as much as possible. Again, we're looking 19,000 there, um, almost 20,000 EHP. It's not as much as the deep space transports, but again, the aim of this is to not get caught. In the low slots then, we have three sets of inertial stabilizers too. This is what gives us that sub align time and turning off the afterburner there, that 3.11 second align time. Nice and easy, get out there quick. For the rigs, two medium cargo hold optimizations are what are giving us that 6,300 to begin with. But again, that's not the full story. Now sometimes 6,300 cubic meters is all you need, and having a sub 4 second align time makes you incredibly hard to catch. There are occasions, however, when you need to carry just that little bit more. So it's worth spending a moment just to talk about what happens if we flip the Prowler around a bit and instead swap out those inertial stabilizers for Cargo Hold Expander 2s. In this case, you can see that our align time does drop to 5.31 seconds. It's still sub 6, which if you know what you're doing with the cloak and micro warp drive trick, is still very hard to catch. It's just not as difficult as the sub 4 second, of course. But this does give us a whopping 13,000 cubic meters of cargo space. We essentially double our cargo space at the cost of an additional second or so of align time. Again, if you are a good enough pilot to be able to escape a gate camp using the cloak and micro warp drive trick, then absolutely changing that fit to do this can work. I do strongly recommend starting out, at least, with the inertial stabilizers fit, just to get used to piloting this ship. Then take it somewhere safe and get a feel for the difference in align time and how it works using the cargo hold expanders. It's up to you, though. Ultimately, I tend to run the smaller fit for this and just use it for carrying things like modules and some basic materials. If I'm carrying a whole load of ores or minerals and stuff like that, then that's when the deep space transport comes in. And of course, having someone who can scout for you kind of negates a lot of the difficulties here. Like, if you know there's a gate camp coming, you can change your route. But if you can't change your route, for example, or a gate camp forms in the split second after your scout arrives, again, this can happen in wormholes then absolutely at least you have the tools to handle that. And I love this. I love this. I think anything that's high risk like this is just a fun gameplay for me. And so running blockade runners or deep space transports, something that is equipped to handle high risk environments, just becomes a ship that I really enjoy. And I also just love the look of the Prowler as well. It's such a cool looking vessel. Anyway, folks, that's everything for this video. Deep Space Transport's Blockade Runners would love to know your thoughts and opinions on these as well. Are they ships that you're flying, that you're having fun with? Do you use these in a different way to I do? Again, which is your favourite? Because I'm sure there are a lot of you watching this that fly them from different empires. And I'd love to hear what kind of usage you get out of them, or some of the crazy stories you have of surviving gate camps, etc. Anyway, folks, that's it for me today. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!